In the last episode of the BS Review, we discussed cord electronics, which I very sarcastically referred to as embargo electronics, uh, watch the video if you want to know why, and specifically talked about the Mojo. In this episode, we continue our trek into the ever murky underworld of audiophile companies. Now we take a look at Astle & Kern, a company that I'm not convinced audiophiles love as much as Cord. So I'm expecting slightly fewer visceral reactions. I do want to emphasize that no matter what I say about Astle & Kern, this commentary and analysis is not meant to disparage anyone who purchased a product from them. If you enjoy an AK product, then nothing I say should matter to you. But if you have thought about buying an AK player or other device, and have been saving money little by little to afford that huge purchase, then maybe this video will be of some help. Ultimately, the purpose of the BS review is to shine a very bright light onto the disgraceful underbelly that feeds and misleads the audiophile world. Astel and Kern, as we will come to find in this video, has done a fabulous job of worming its way right into the depths of the stinking pit. We've been ratted out here, boys. Watch it. Chapter 1 Icarus, you bastard! I love the Greeks. They have hummus, feta cheese, gyros, and baklava. Oh, and they also have an old story about some idiot that decided to fly with wax wings. It's an ancient fable. It goes something like this. Icarus was the son of a craftsman. Father and son were trapped on an island and planned to escape. The father, knowing he had to save his son from lifelong imprisonment, thought and thought about how he could help his son live a free life. One day, the idea came to him. The father, being a craftsman and all, decided to make wings of wax so that he and his son Icarus could fly off the island. As the story goes, the escape plan was conceived, the wings made, and the day of judgment came. Just before their flight, the father turned to Icarus and warned him, Icarus, don't fly too low to the water, and don't fly too high. Follow me and do as I do. Icarus promised he would obey. So off the father and son went, fly, fly they did. Both excitedly looked back at the island and joy filled them as they realized they were going home. But in his exuberance, Icarus forgot his father's warning. Instead of following his father, Icarus soared higher and higher, relishing the thrill. The higher he went, the warmer the sun felt on his face. That warmth made him feel as if he was a god, doing what no other man had done, fly ever closer to the heavens. But his wings, you know, the ones made of wax, started to melt. By the time Icarus realized what was happening, it was too late. Wings melted, he fell back to Earth like a meteor. Unlike the story before about Humpty Dumpty, there are plenty of sources to explain Icarus's tale. Most historians and fabulists agree it is a warning to those who are overambitious and the dreadful fate of those who are complacent and full of hubris. Astel and Kern is our Icarus, and funny enough, they are the ones who compare themselves to the Greeks. Consequently, I think it is apropos to treat A.K. like the idiot son who simply couldn't listen. Come, let us talk of this idiot. Chapter 2 You're never too young to bullshit. I started my audiophile journey about a year ago. Before then, I knew nothing about headphones other than they came with my phone. I had no interest in buying more and more expensive audio gear, and part of me wishes I had never actually started. What I do recall, however, is that Astle & Kern was all over marketing, mentioned online, on YouTube, and their products were hailed as essential audiophile gear. 
I always wanted AK stuff because I was told it was fabulous and it was perfect sounding and it made your ears sigh with relief and that the music it had, well, it sent it to you like it was a sweet whisper from a fairy. Flowery language, right? Yeah, I know, but I'm trying to say things just like AK would. You see, if you can say one thing about AK, it's that they take marketing bullshit up another notch or two. I don't know if it's a language barrier or a lack of self-control, but AK simply cannot help but make some outrageous claims. And that's saying something for an audiophile world. Let's start at the beginning. Astell & Kern is an iRiver company. You likely have run across iRiver many times. You see, iRiver makes a lot of ugly and cheap accessories for iPods, phones, and audio gear in general. And they decided to open house with a new face. They started to make audio players under the Astel & Kern brand. You know, it's like when you one day see a terrible restaurant suddenly change names and excitedly think you're getting a better restaurant in its place. Only, of course, when you walk into the new place, the menu looks the same, the decor is the same, and the food is just as unpalatable. Now, I know, that's a bit harsh towards AK, I admit iRiver clearly knew its products were shit, and consequently it was really easy for AK to make its products seem even better in comparison. Now that's what I call marketing genius. Anyway, the first AK player that I know of came out in 2013. Surprised? That's only six years ago. And yet, AK's name is ubiquitous with hi-fi perfection. AK slash iRiver churned out products like a subpar meat factory produces bologna. In January 2013, they released their first player, the AK100. Then in July 2013, they released an IEM, an in-ear monitor. And a month later, in August, AK released the successor to the AK100, which they called the AK120. And then in October 2013, they released an update to the AK120 called the AK120 Titan. Okay, uh, let's stop for a second. Does this sound a little crazy to you? I wasn't making a linguistic mistake when I said that the AK120 was the successor to the AK100. Yeah, the two devices were released within months of each other. Could you imagine being the person who bought the AK100 only to find out a few months later that you had an inferior product? The thing with AK is that they have churned and churned and churned. It's like going to an ice cream shop and having a never-ending supply of self-serve soft ice cream. That runny, fake ice cream is making a mess everywhere. Actually, AK's motto can be summed up in the following way. It's never too much! You'd argue that, yes, fine, AK released several products in 2013, but surely there is an excuse. They were new and wanted to get a lot of options out immediately. They wanted to provide a wide swath of product lineups at various prices. I wish that could be true. Instead, AK's product releases for 2013 were about average for a six-year lifespan. Would you believe that from 2013 to 2018, AK has released 35 products? Of those 35, 20 have been audio players. So here's the thing. One would assume that as a hi-fi gear manufacturer, and one that markets itself as catering to audiophiles, you'd want to take your time and produce quality products. You want to learn from your prior successes and mistakes, take feedback, and try to measurably improve upon the past. Instead, it appears that AK functions like Nike and mass-produces shoes that have slight changes in form but with uglier designs. It's difficult, near impossible, to find the original prices for the earlier products. But judging by AK's recent pricing history, I think it's safe to say that none of AK's prior releases have been sold for less than $600. Indeed, their most current expensive player is $3,500. Now, you may not be impressed. Allow me to explain. You see, when a company releases products at such breakneck speed, it's clearly not listening to feedback. It's a logistical nightmare to design products that can use the same motherboards and circuitry, source all of that material, have it ready to assemble, and get a manufacturer who can make and pack and ship the products. These types of products are designed and made at least a year in advance. And when you're releasing at least five products every year, you don't have time to make changes. 
Which then leads us to the question of how is AK selling so many products at once? Well, you know, through the generous use of deceptive marketing, of course. Chapter 3. Never Gonna Stop Bullshitting You I love the Wayback Machine. No one can hide from its powers of time travel, and it was very helpful in showing AK's bullshit history. I searched the Wayback Machine for astolandkern.com. I was a little surprised to see that they had two website snapshots from October and December of 2012, even before a single product had been released. Okay, no big deal, they just wanted to reserve a website. So I went to the December 2012 web snapshot, and boy, AK's bullshit machine was already in full swing. You see, AK decided to advertise at the top of their website the following, and I quote, Enter the marvelous world of music realism. The Astel and Kern is the ultimate portable high fidelity audio system capable of studio mastering quality sound. Wait, what? Astel and Kern is the ultimate portable high fidelity audio system? How is that possible since no AK product would be released until 2013? Oh, well, maybe AK was future predicting its success. I bet there's no hubris in that, I'm sure. I then jumped ahead to the Wayback Machine to August 13th, 2013. It was rather fun going through AK's old family photos. <laughs> the AK-100 right next to the better AK-120. <laughs> what a happy family. Anyway, both the AK-100 and the AK-120 were heavily pushing MQS, or Mastering Quality Sound. Huh? Mastering Quality Sound? What's that, you ask? Oh, you are indeed perceptive. You see, I was a little confused myself. I first thought AK was referring to MQA, Master Quality Authenticated, the file system that Tidal has been pushing, and by the way, overhyped. So I dug a little and tried to confirm this. It turns out that MQA, what Tidal uses, is not the same as MQS, what AK uses. Indeed, one is an actual file compression technology recognized as an option for music streaming and downloaded files. The other is AK's imagination gone wild. Some rudimentary information. Before we go any further, let's talk briefly about audio file formats. I uploaded a video about high-res file formats several weeks ago. Watch that for more info. There are a number of standard file formats, and by standard, I mean recognized by the audiophile community and widely available for use. Let's go through some of them. There's PCM, or Pulse Code Modulation. This is the starting baseline for file format. Audio is easily available in PCM, which is recorded in either 16 or 24 or 32-bit and sampled at either 44.1 or 192 kHz sample rate, though higher sample rates are indeed available. The faster the sample rate, the more detail you can retrieve in a given period of time. The higher the bit rate, the more detail that can be stored for retrieval. Then there's DSD, or Direct Stream Digital. Now this is all the rage currently. DSD compatible this, DSD to all that. DSD was significantly fewer bits. Indeed, it has a bit rate of 1 bit to PCM 16, 24, or 32. But it makes up for the shortfall by sampling the bits exponentially faster than PCM. You see, the standard DSD sample is recorded at 64 times faster than PCM. So it retrieves the information 64 times faster than the standard PCM file. Then we have MQA, or Master Quality Authenticated. This is mainly used for streaming services like Tidal. In fact, Tidal has kind of bet its fortune on MQA. It is an encoding format. Essentially, MQA takes a raw recording and then encodes it into a smaller package. It folds the inaudible frequencies into the ones that we can hear. Imagine that a recording is made at 96 kHz. MQA would then fold that into a 44.1 kHz sample rate, resulting in a smaller file. Once played on an MQA-compatible device, the 44.1 kHz is unfolded to 96 kHz. The problem is, you'll end up missing some information here and there in the entire process. Then there's MP3, which is the granddaddy of all compressed music. Do you remember the 90s? Seinfeld. VCR, Hansen, oh, and yeah, MP3. 
This was the file format used to upload music for illegal download. And then it became the standard compression format for ripping and burning CDs and eventually listening to music on a player. It's a terrible file compression system, one which loses tremendous amount of detail. Then there's FLAC, or Free Lossless Audio Codec. This is essentially the same idea as MP3. It compresses the audio file, but more like a zip file than downsizing it as MP3 does. In other words, just as you would unpack a zip file to reveal a much larger file within, FLAC packages music files into a smaller format, which then can be unzipped to reveal a larger file within, one containing noticeably more detail than an MP3 recording. FLAC is CD quality recording up to 32 bits. Back to MQS and AK Psychosis. Let me put it bluntly. There is no such thing as MQS as a separate file format like the ones we just discussed. I researched online for an MQS format and came back with nothing. Google kept recommending Tidal. Go to hell, Tidal. It turns out that the only information about MQS is available from AK. How weird, huh? Does that mean that AK created a new file format that nobody else has? <laughs> Don't be silly, AK is not in the business to innovate. They just like to imaginate. Imagination. Imagination. AK has a web page dedicated to explaining MQS. Brace yourself for the bullshit storm. It's a category four. Now, you'd think that MQS is a unique, radical, or different file format, wouldn't you? I mean, AK says over and over again that this is MQS and alludes it is the king of audio formats. So surely, this is technology that AK has created and patented and all other competitors have to make do with that PCM, DSD, and MQA. Those poor bastards. If only they have the power of the Greek gods like AK does. However, it appears that a bit of linguistic gymnastics has been achieved. Let's take a closer look. AK says that MQS is, quote, 24-bit, 192 kilohertz high-resolution audio is considered studio quality and also referred to as mastering quality sound. Wait, what? 24-bit at 192 kilohertz? Isn't that PCM? Yeah, it's PCM. I mean, it's at a higher end of PCM, but PCM nonetheless. And the fun gets even more funner. In smaller print, AK says, I quote, Astolin Kern natively supports MQS, which is the closest quality to the original sound intended by a recording artist. Mastering quality sound is an acronym of collective lossless and high resolution audio source formats that typically come encoded with 24 bit, 44 to 192 kilohertz of bit sampling rates. Since MQS delivers about 6.5 times more detail than a conventional CD, listeners can enjoy a more realistic music experience. To anyone who hasn't done the research or doesn't understand, let me break this down. MQS is simply PCM, period. AK says that their players natively support MQS at 24-bit up to 192 kilohertz. Well, that's good, but all other modern players also natively support the same bit and sampling rates. You know why? Because that is PCM. But if you thought the bullshit store was going to leave it at that, you're wrong. AK is on a bullshit sale. You get some bullshit, and you get some bullshit, and you get some bullshit. Here's the interesting part. Nowhere on the MQS webpage does AK say that their players natively upscale all recordings to MQS. All they say is that their players support MQS. What does that mean? It means that if the recording you put on the AK player is not 24-bit 192 kilohertz, then the AK player is not going to magically make it 24-bit 192 kilohertz. So, in other words, in order to enjoy MQS, you'll need to have MQS files, which you can play on nearly any modern audio device. Here's the thing. AK's MQS is nothing. It is literally nothing. They didn't create new technology, didn't find a way to upconvert recordings, didn't get a special gift from the Greek gods. Instead, AK is simply serving a healthy dose of bullshit. Nobody uses MQS as a way to describe PCM. 
Only AK does. And why is that? Well, I think because AK didn't know how to sell their products. Priced out of the range of most normal people, AK had to convince audiophiles and other potential buyers why AK players are worth it. Astral and Kern banked on one thing. People are too dumb to realize when they're being had. So, AK renamed an already existing technology, gave the impression it was something brand new, and sold it like a Chinese street vendor sells fake Gucci bags and the uninformed American traveler thinks that she's got a great deal. AK's marketing makes it appear that MQS is the top of the line audio format. They call it high res and said it's the closest you'll get to the artist's original recording. Blah, blah, blah. Look, if you read between the lines and you know your stuff, you can see that AK's propaganda is laughable. But others can and will be easily misled to believing that MQS is the highest possible audio format. Indeed, AK says that MQS is special because it has such a high sample rate. They proclaim, the higher the sampling and bit rates, the closer you will hear the original sound that is as it was intended. And since AK has the MQS technology, it was most definitely the most bestest. Which it isn't. Remember DSD? The standard DSD format sampling rate is 64 times that of PCM. And DSD goes all the way up to 512. DSD isn't new either. You can date its conception back to the late 1960s, and it became mainstream in 2011, two years before AK's debut. Whether you'll actually hear the difference between DSD64 and DSD512 is debatable, and whether PCM is truly an inferior recording to a DSD recording is also up for argument. But it is absolutely clear that MQS is not something new, and nothing unique to AK. You see, it's never too early in a company's life to start bullshitting. AK proves that. Chapter 4. That's one big pile of bullshit. That is one big pile of shit. When I research and write BS review scripts, I, I try to focus on a particular aspect of a company and its product. I also try to relate a story that is engaging and descriptive of the company. The hurdle with Astral and Kern is that I don't know where to go. There are so many different aspects of bullshit with this company that one could easily get lost. I mean, we just spent a considerable amount of time on the first year of AK's life. How big can this pile of bullshit be? Well, as it turns out, as big as a dinosaur. The best way to tell the story, I think, is to keep to the basics. What is Astral and Kern really about? I'll give you a few examples. Southwest Airlines wants to be North America's airline of choice, offering cheap seats and capitalizing on mass transit to make money. Porsche wants to be the driver's sports car manufacturer, not so concerned about Uber luxury as much as handling and customer service. Chipotle wants to serve millions of people every day with shitty food that gives them diarrhea, thereby fully solidifying themselves as America's illest fast food restaurant. What about Astle and Kern? Well, I looked at their most updated about webpage, and it became apparent that AK doesn't really know who it is. They first start out by saying that they are the ultimate digital music source that brings you mastering quality sound. Oh, here we go again. Are we still hitching the wagon to that MQS jackass? Huh. Then it becomes clear that AK simply can't figure it out. They explain the reason for their name, Astle and Kern. I'll quote them directly. Astel means star in Latin, and Kern means center in German. We believe Astel and Kern is the center of music. Latin and German? You mean like the Romans and the Germanic tribes? They hated each other. The Germans invaded Rome and sacked it twice. The Romans made war on the Germans for centuries. For Christ's sake, Julius Caesar became famous for his war on the Germans. Look, I doubt that the Latins and the Germans would like to be at the center of anything together. Here's a rather pointless diatribe about this. I think when a company chooses a name for itself, it should have a purpose. The name should tell the consumer what the company and its product is, and should be very easy to remember. Most importantly, the company should know its history and have a goal before deciding upon a name. 
Astrid Kern evidently didn't Google search Latin and German in one phrase. Center of the Stars is their name? It sounds like a name some hippie parents would give their daughter who would end up working at a diner, marry a drug dealer, and get pregnant and kill the child after a psychotic breakdown! Do you see what bad names can do? <sighs> From what I can gather, looking at the About webpage, AK simply wants to say that it has state-of-the-art technology that will provide standard sound quality easily available everywhere. Their bullshit is so obvious. Instead of talking about why their products are better, they spend the vast majority of their webpage saying that the MP3 recordings are bad and MQS is great. MP3? Who's burning MP3 music anymore? And by the way, the average person is not looking at AK's website to purchase a product. The type of person who is going to buy an AK product is someone who enjoys music and has a passion for it. Consequently, that person is not listening to MP3s. Do you now see how difficult it is to review this company? How do you talk to a person with bipolar disorder? That's what this feels like. I'm trying to describe to you the psyche of a bipolar astral and current. But like with everything in life, there's always some fundamental thing we can discuss. I mean, even with a bipolar person, you can talk about the weather. So let's focus on two of AK's product-wide claims. The first, MQS, and the second, technology that brings natural and original sound without distortion. Chapter 5. I am not going to talk about MQS anymore. Look, I really shouldn't have to talk about MQS anymore. We talked about it already. It's not a real thing. It's merely PCM relabeled and wrapped in AK's Gucci bag. It is almost as if AK is stuck in the early 2000s and can't move on. Talking about MP3 and how inferior it is to MQS is like saying your Honda Accord is so much better than the Edsel. Could you imagine a reaction if you got on a plane and the pilot said of the intercom? Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for, uh, flying Center of Stars Airlines. Uh, our planes still have both wings. You'd freak out! Chapter 6. In Astral and Kern's view, the word original has a different meaning. Astral and Kern's shtick is making your music sound like the exact recording of any live performance. How do you begin to support or debunk that kind of statement? I suppose we look at their bottom line tier, their entry level player, the SR15, and their only desktop amp deck, the L1000. Get ready, the shitstorm has evolved to category 5. The SR15 is a $700 player with features of a $300 player. The SR15 is AK's first entry level player. AK says that the player sets the standard for hi fi audio for novice listeners. They say this is the beginning point of the hi-fi audio experience that allows you to enjoy the philosophy and technologies of Astral and Kern, which is accoladed by audiophiles around the world. Oh, boy. First of all, there is no such word as accolated. Second, AK assumes that people don't know how to listen. Novice listeners, it says. You see, those of you who have never heard an AK player simply don't know, haven't learned how to listen. Did you know that you use your ears to hear sounds? I bet you didn't know that until AK told you. I can break this down rather simply. The SR15 is AK's gateway drug. They tell you that the SR15 has some of the technology that only select few have ever experienced. And you too can start your journey, but you have to buy the SR15. And then, once you learn how to listen, you should upgrade to a new player so that you can be welcomed into the audiophile club. This marketing is nothing short of derogatory. It insults your intelligence. It insults you. It does what AK has been doing since its inception in 2013. Once again, AK proclaims it holds the secret to perfect sound, and you'd be lucky to get access. Linguistic insults aside, there's a lot more here to slap you in the face. Everything else in their current lineup starts at $900 and higher. The SR15's most catching feature is the tilted screen. AK says it's so that you can grip the player and look at the screen naturally. Frankly, when I hold it, I feel like I'm going cross-eyed. The SR15 plays up to 24-bit at 192kHz MQS. Right, so it plays standard PCM audio. It also natively supports DSD, but it doesn't. You see, the marketing says that the SR15 has native DSD, giving the impression that all you have 
to do is play your high-res DSD files and the SR15 will be compliant. You'd be mistaken. See, in the fine print at the very bottom of the webpage, AK was legally required to explain what the native DSD capability can actually do. You see, we in America are extremely volatile, disruptive, agitated, and litigious. AK clarifies that DSD is native up to 64 megahertz. Boy, that sounds fantastic, except that the standard DSD file is 64 megahertz. DSD 128, 256, and 512 are not supported. Instead, any DSD file over 64 is downsampled to PCM. You know those albums you spent $30 a piece to download in DSD 512? You'll hear it in standard PCM quality. Congratulations. The specs of the SR15 are equally unimpressive, though wrapped so nicely in AK's Gucci bag. Let's take a look. The DAC for the SR15 is the Cirrus Logic 43198. The Wi-Fi is standard BGNN, the Bluetooth is 4.1, the screen is 3.3 inches with the 480 by 800, re 800 resolution. The player has both balanced and unbalanced. The THD plus N is 0 .0008 for unbalanced and 0 .0009 for balanced. The PCM is 24-bit at 192 kilohertz, and the SD, well, is standard 64. Uh, strangely, AK managed to make the balanced output sound noisier than the unbalanced. Yeah, it, I know it's not a noticeable difference, but that begs the question. Why have a balanced output if there's not a noticeable difference when compared to the unbalanced? Let's talk a little bit about that Cirrus Logic chip. DAC chipsets are varied, but are getting more and more alike. The manufacturers are tripping over themselves to get the cleanest and most clinical sound signature, which, by the way, I don't think is particularly fun. Anyway, the 43198 is Cirrus Logic's newest chip. It's made specifically for mobile devices. It supports up to 384 kHz sampling rate and DSD-256. Wait, what? Did I see it can sample up to 384 kHz and play DSD-256? <laughs> yeah, I sure did. Are you getting the picture? AK took the Cirrus Logic chip and claims it is the highest quality chipset that you can find. AK waxes and wanes about how wonderful this new chip is, making you think that Astral and Kern is so kind to put that chip in such a cheap device. Except, AK took the chip and disabled it. It purposefully limited the sample rate by half. It limited DSD playback by two levels of magnitude. It doesn't allow the SR15 to play DSD-128 or DSD-256, which the Cirrus Logic chip does in fact support. This seems a bit strange, doesn't it? I mean, you're paying $700 for this damned sophisticated device, but it turns out that the SR15 is not nearly the amazing device it was implied to be. Well, a lot like the new Star Wars movies. But NTR, the SR15 is amazing. There is no other player on the market that could possibly compete with all these features. Well, let's assume there is, uh, because there is. How I shall tell you now about the features of a comparable product. And I want you to guess what it is and how much it costs. I really like this game. I already know the answer. Are you ready? Here we go. This secret product has the AK4490EN times 2, meaning two AKM chipsets. It's got the Wi-Fi for AGNN, same like the Astle and Kern. It's got Bluetooth at 4.2 instead of the AK's 4.1. It has AirPlay, but the SR15 doesn't. It's got a slightly smaller screen at 3.2 inches, but the same resolution at 480 by 800. It supports PCM at 32 bits up to 192 kilohertz. It supports DSD from standard 64 and 128, and it has a THD plus N of 0.002%, both balanced and unbalanced. Can you guess? Can you guess what it is? Oh, all right, I'll put you out of your misery. The player with all these features is the FIO M9. It's a $300 device which comes short in two respects. The screen is 2.5 millimeters smaller and the THD plus N is higher. Though, to be frank, you'd have to have some excellent ears to hear the difference between 0.002 and 0.0009. Let's be honest, FIO isn't being overly generous either. Their chipset, the 4490EN, supports DSD up to 256 and also has a sample rate for PCM up to 768 kHz. But I can't shake the feeling that the M9 has somewhat better specs than the SR15. Is it my imagination or does the SR15 lose in this comparison? 
Let's see. The Fio has a more advanced Bluetooth chip. It can play DSD up to 128. It has a higher PCM bitrate of 32 versus 24 on the SR15. It can play AirPlay. It has both balanced and unbalanced ports. And the screen size is virtually the same. Now, you may say that the SR15 has that Aslan Kern finish. AK has invested a lot of time into its user interface. That surely makes up for the uh, uh, $400 difference, right? So can we call this a tie? Or can we all agree that the SR15 is a total ripoff? The Greek gods did not create the L1000. I uploaded reviews about the Acro L1000. I purchased that desktop amp deck at a very significant discount. I kind of like the silky smooth sound it provides. It's a bit unique, and from a DAC amp, it's kind of something special. It's like the DAC amp version of the ZMF Icon, but it costs $900, and it doesn't do what AK advertises. AK says that they got the idea for the L1000 from the ancient Greeks. They said, quote, the Acro L1000 resembles the golden ratio of the Parthenon of Athens. Like the golden ratio stays consistent and never changes, Astelin Kern has designed the L1000 to serve the never changing value of music, providing the original sound distortion free. The issue I encountered when reviewing this unit was, well, there were several issues. First, although the design was certainly unique, it was altogether stupid. The angled nature of the L1000 makes it impossible to see the volume LEDs unless the unit is placed directly in front of you. And that giant knob, although smooth to move, is unnecessarily big. It serves no purpose than to obscure the volume LEDs. The headphone ports are on the left side, which means that when space is limited, you're out of luck. Unlike every other amp deck that has ports at the front for easy access, the L1000 puts it at the left near the bottom and out of sight so that you can't get easy access to it. The L1000 is made of aluminum. There are two problems with this. The L1000 is very light, so when you press a button or turn the knob, the whole unit moves. I don't think that the golden ratio is supposed to move. Also, AK claims that the aluminum maximizes sound clarity. I can't understand how the housing of an amp deck has anything to do with the electrical current it sends to the headphones. Is the L1000's aluminum full of goblins and fairies to help the electrons on their way? I'm a bit skeptical when it comes to audiophile claims, but this is just ridiculous. And the ridiculous matter hasn't started to register just yet. The second problem I encountered was that the filters don't do jack shit. AK says that the L1000 has three filters, neutral, bass boost, and high gain. I experimented extensively with all these filters using various headphones, and there was no audible difference at all. In fact, the high gain filter didn't increase the volume at all. The third problem I found is that although the AK says that the L1000 has 15 watts of power for speakers, it doesn't mention anything about power output for headphones. There's no information on this regarding the L1000's power output on AK's website or in the user manual. In fact, when I tested the L1000 using my Allo Audio S4R, a 32 ohm pair of headphones, I had to crank the volume up to halfway before the headphones got loud. Frankly, I just couldn't help but point, at, point this out. AK decided to disable the 4490EN chip in the L1000. You see, the 4490EN can sample PCM at 768kHz, but AK, in all its Greek wisdom, decided to limit the sample rate by half. So, even when AK is charging you $900 for a desktop DAC amp, it can't stop itself from cheating. Chapter 7. Why do people like Astral and Kern? Why are people drawn to Astro and Kern? What entices them to pay at least twice the cost for a similar device from another manufacturer? What drives audiophiles to continually back AK products? Part of the equation is the ridiculous marketing. Those who can't read between the lines or simply don't know any better can be easily misled by the marketing, snazzy photos, and the self-proclaimed superiority. Indeed, everywhere on AK's website you read claims that AK is the best and their products are the most high-end. I've had many interactions with people who ask about end-game headphones and amps and DACs. 
They are ready to put down several thousand dollars because they believe that the most expensive product is absolutely the best. These people mean well, I'm sure. But I'm convinced they simply don't know how to distinguish outrageous claims from truth, especially since audiophile reviewers fawn over companies like Astle and Kern and Cord. It's hard to grasp our minds around the astronomical prices companies charge and the idea that those products will never be worth that price. We all know companies upcharge to make a profit, but it is still difficult to accept that perhaps we've been lied to, or to put it more colloquially, we've been had. Yeah, but that's exactly what's going on. When reviewers don't hold audiophile companies accountable, those companies get away with the proverbial murder. They kill your wallet. They kill your ability to think clearly. They kill independence. Look at AK. These guys, from their inception, unashamedly bombarded the market with players, tripping over themselves to release an updated player within months after the first was out. They marketed MQS and was very clearly alluded it has some new mysterious sound format that could never be achieved before. They still cling to that ethos. Indeed, their about webpage harps on the MP3 and promotes MQS even in 2019. AK lied. They lied, and at the very least, they lied about the MQS. In my opinion, there are two types of lies. There's the obvious lie. For example, Donald Trump is the best president of all time. Then there's the more subtle lie, like Donald Trump is sane. You can quantify the one, but you can't to the other. When a company like Cord says that the Mojo is a reference class DAC and compares it to a $36,000 DAC, that's a statement that can be objectively quantified. It's an obvious lie. You can rip into the claim and find out what's going on, look at the measurements, and review the features. But the more subtle lie is the one that's more dangerous, I think. A subtle lie is one that is born of a simple comment, a nudge, in a certain direction. It is planted into the back of your mind where it sprouts. And over time, along with the help from others, that lie becomes a fact. And then it becomes difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. Astel and Kern is the subtle liar. It makes no quantifiable claims about its products. Just vague statements like, we have the best products. We have provided distortion-free sound. Our products allow you to listen to words in the original way. But these are claims that are impossible to test. Whether something is the best is always up for interpretation. Whether something is distortion-free is misleading in two ways. First, saying something is distortion-free doesn't say what unpleasant distortion would be there if AK didn't bring his godly powers to your ears. What is the distortion you're talking about? Is it electrical noise? Is it frequency incoherence produced by poorly soldered components? Is it noise introduced by an internal power supply? What is it, AK? Second, the claim that something is distortion-free implies that someone else's product is full of its distortion. Oh my god, Theo never said that the M9 is distortion-free, and oh shit, Cohen's website doesn't say anything about distortion-free sound. It's as if you walk into a store to buy a Pepsi. You get in line, and the guy in front of you at the counter suddenly turns, looks at you, turns back at the clerk, and says, at least I didn't steal, and walks out. Wouldn't it be natural for the clerk to immediately suspect that you have stolen something from the store, and that nice man just tipped him off to your thieving ways? AK is shameless. Shameless in his propaganda. Shameless in his marketing. Shameless in withholding a product's full potential from its customers. Shameless in its lying. So, why do people like AK? I think a large part of it has to do with looking into the past and refusing to see the current nature of things. You see, Chinese products used to be really badly manufactured. They looked ugly, functioned poorly, and simply were not worth it. But that's not nearly the case anymore. It hasn't been for many years. Theo, for example, has done a brilliant job of changing that landscape, providing competitive products at cheaper prices. But it's more than that, I think. It is also the question of what type of audiophile you are. Do you love to listen to your music, enjoying it no matter where you are and what you're listening to? Or are you the type that likes flashy things that go bling bling? If you're the true audiophile, then Astral and Kern is a joke. You know their claims are rubbish. You know how music is recorded, what the human ear can hear, and what CD quality is. 
You read AK's idiotic marketing and shake your head. That's not stuff you care about. But if you're Puff Daddy wannabe, you like your jewelry. You like sharp edges, tilted screens, and the acronyms plastered on your boxes. DSD, PCM, MQA, MQS, DOP. You like to show off your portable player with your giant headphones. You want the attention. Oh, and yeah, you like music too. It's kind of good to listen to some tracks, you know? Now, don't take offense. I understand completely. If you're the flashy type, more power to you. Go spend the $1,700 in your pocket on an AK player. Go drop $3,000 on an Abyss headphone. Walk around with that combo because just like Kanye, you're a motherfucking genius. And frankly, <laughs> there's no help for you. Those who simply refuse to distinguish fact from fiction are too far gone. They can't be saved. But those who haven't had the subtle lie implanted yet, you can still save yourselves. Fight back. Don't buy into the bullshit. Don't believe hi-fi reviewers. Don't get tricked with the acronym soup. Don't let flashy websites and neat visuals throw you off. Look at the claims. And when something sounds too good to be true, it likely is. And when you realize a company is trying to feed you a load of bullshit, that's because it likely is. Conclusion In the end, Astral & Kern is a company that should not be trusted. It has recently released the SR-15 for the singular purpose of getting its hooks into the middle class. There aren't enough people in the world who will buy a new $1,700 Astral & Kern player every year. So, AK looked to the middle class market and found it was saturated by really good products. Theos and Cowens and Pioneers and Sonys. And banking on its Roman German name, Astral & Kern introduced its cheapest product, the SR-15. They say it is for the novice listeners. In other words, for those who don't know better. AK released its first desktop amp deck, and it is absurdly priced. Its lack of features is outweighed only by its unignorable failures. AK is full of subtle lies and vague marketing. It is helped along by audiophile reviewers who placate to AK giving full stars and back slaps as if the company had achieved a milestone. But Astral and Kern is flying too close to the sun. Don't follow it, because you know better. If you enjoyed this content, if you enjoy any of my other content on my channel, then please do consider becoming a patron. Your patronage, your money, once a month, every month, will help me keep this channel going. I think it's important for audiophile reviewers to be objective and separate from the audiophile manufacturers. That's why I buy my own products. And every day I have people asking me to buy things I don't currently own. I currently have five very giving and generous patrons and I thank them so much for sharing some of their hard earned money with me. And if you would like to consider becoming a patron, donating a few dollars to me every month, once a month, that would be truly appreciated. If you're currently not a subscriber but do like to watch my content, then please consider becoming a subscriber. And to all of my subscribers currently, thank you so much for subscribing to my channel. I love getting notifications every day that I've got one more subscriber. Finally, if you have any questions or comments, then please leave them in the comment section below. If you want to request a review of a product I currently own, please look at the review form listed in the description below. I hope that all of you have a wonderful, amazing evening. Thanks for joining me.